Hi everyone, I'm here to report on Ant-Man, uh, it's the latest Marvel film, of course, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or the MCU as they like to call it, um, which ties into uh, all the various Avengers movies and what have you, which means that Ant-Man was probably going to be a part of the Avengers at some point. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was originally going to be directed by Edgar Wright, who'd been developing for a long time, but uh, then he uh, dropped out uh, because of, you know, creative conflicts, I think, with Marvel Studios. So Peyton Reed was brought in to direct. Peyton Reed was a director I did not have a lot of confidence in. Um, you know, not to say that he would do a bad job, but um, what movies of his have I seen? What movies of his have I liked? Hardly any. Um, so, you know, that was uh, not necessarily uh, something that uh, was a positive. However, um, you know, uh, as with most Marvel movies, they have a really great cast in the film, and there's uh, some decent set pieces as well. Um, so while I have a couple of issues with the movie, mostly related to the editing as far as things just happening a little bit too suddenly or too quickly to be believable, like, say, with, with Ant-Man, you've got this um, technology that not only allows Paul Rudd to shrink down to small size, but he's also able to use mind control to manipulate ants and have them do his bidding, basically, to help him on whatever it is he's trying to do. Um, and so the issue with that is, is that when they go and invade this lab to steal some stuff, uh, he's using ants to help him, but there also are, like, large groups of ants all throughout the place that seem to be there before he even gets there helping him out. I'm like, how did they get in there, you know? How did they manage to get in so quickly when he had to do all this crazy stuff just in order to get into at that point? Um, there's one scene where he's sitting in a car and he mind controls the ants to basically spin a coin on the dash, but that would mean that the ants came in through the cracks in the dash. How did they get in there? And how did they get in there so quickly? I mean, he just starts thinking and already they're there. You'd think it would take a few minutes for them to crawl up in there, but of course... We don't want to waste the viewer's time with, uh, you know, something something plausible like that. Um, so yeah, there's that. There's just there's just other moments in which um, things seem to be cut out of scenes, uh, which means that characters change position abruptly, or things just seem to happen kind of more suddenly or much too quickly to be to be believable. There's a scene where um, both Paul Rudd and his adversary, um, uh, who's played by uh, Corey Stoll. Um, they each have their own suit, and at one point, each of them has to put it on really quickly. Well, it's like they put the whole thing on in two seconds, you know? There's all these zippers and everything, it's kind of tight, they have to put on gloves, they have to put on boots, they have to grab the helmet, and they do all that in like an instant, in, on both occasions. It's just like totally implausible. However, aside from those quibbles, I really liked the movie a lot. thought it was a lot of fun, it was really funny, the set pieces were really exciting, um, and this is one of the few movies that I actually went and saw in 3D, and I'm really glad that I did, because those shrinking effects and the and the, and the sequences that take place during the shrinking segments are really, really great in 3D. They're a lot, a lot of fun. Not that you wouldn't enjoy it in 2D, but not that I wouldn't enjoy it in 2D. I probably would, but I really thought it was quite spectacular looking. Um, and what's different about this movie is that there isn't some huge, massive climax. Um, there's a big battle at the end, but it takes place entirely within one house. As a matter of fact, most of it takes place within a kid's bedroom, <laughs> which, of course, when you're super, super small, is a lot bigger than a bedroom ordinarily would be. But still, it was kind of amusing to see, you know, them running around in the carpet and on the furniture and on the train set and everything like that. And it's like, becomes big and epic with massive explosions. And then you get, you know, the objective view. And it's just like this little train running around the track with tiny little laser beams being shot from one end to the other. It's, it's pretty fun. Um, all the cast is really good. Uh, I like Corey Stoll a lot. I've been enjoying him ever since he was in um, The Born Legacy and the first season of House of Cards. Uh, Evangeline Lilly, of course. Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas has a flashback scene in the very beginning of the movie, which takes place in 1989. And the younger version of Michael Douglas that they created with effects is really, really stunning. I, I wouldn't... I couldn't say that I totally bought it because I know how these things work. They use effects. But still, I mean, as far as the difference between, say, the young Patrick Stewart in X-Men Origins Wolverine and the young Michael Douglas in this movie is just night and day. It just looks so much more convincing. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really a lot of fun. Um, and Paul Rudd's a great choice. Great choice to play this guy. There's some good supporting characters, of course. Uh, Michael Pena, of course, uh, is really, really funny as one of Paul Rudd's uh, closest friends. Uh, yeah, lots of fun. Really, really fun movie. Um, and I decided to take this opportunity, since this movie just came out, 
um, to um, rank all the Marvel movies so far. Oh, one more thing. Um, it's been said that Ant-Man is the last movie in Phase 2, except that all the Phase 2 movies have someone's arm getting cut off. That's sort of like a tribute to The Empire Strikes Back, every single one from like Iron Man 3 forward. Um, but I don't remember that happening in this movie. I don't think anyone's arm got lopped off at, at any point in Ant-Man. So, you know, maybe that makes it Phase 3. I don't know. I would consider it the start of Phase 3, really. I mean, you know, uh, Age of Ultron really did seem like the conclusion for Phase 2. Um, anyway... So here's my ranking of the MCU from uh, all 12 movies from worst to best, with the worst coming first. And that one would be The Incredible Hulk. Still, for me, a completely pointless movie, you know. I mean, it's not just the, the, the replacement of the main character or the main actor in the role, but also it's just like it has hardly any bearing uh, on what's going on in the rest of the uh, story, and it's just, uh, you know, not... Um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, it's just uh, nothing, nothing that's really worth holding on to with that movie. I would just skip it all together. Um, Captain America, The First Adventure. Again, never really liked this movie. There's just key moments, important things that they just gloss right over and skip over. Some of it I like, and I like some of the actors in it, but yeah, not that much. Um, Avengers Age of Ultron. Yes, I am ranking that movie this low. <laughs> uh, I really was disappointed in some important things, you know, just because I felt there was so much that needed to be crammed in there. Just so much information that they just sort of rushed through all kinds of stuff. And also I thought that James Spader was kind of miscast as Ultron. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy. It's an okay movie. I'm not crazy about it. Thor 2. I uh, really like this movie. It's very inventive and fun, but it has a terrible villain. Uh, <laughs> completely dull villain. Um, then after that, Iron Man 2, and then the first Thor movie, and then Ant-Man. Nice strong showing from Ant-Man. And then Iron Man, the first one, Iron Man 3, Captain America, the Winter Soldier, and, of course, the Avengers from 2012 would be the best out of the lot. Um, and I also thought I'd take this time to rank the villains, um, <laughs> just for fun, just just for kicks. So um, I looked all, up all their names, all their proper names, uh, and made a little list right here. Um, the worst of the lot, as I said, was from Thor the Dark World. That's Malekith, the dark elf who's played by Christopher Eccleston. And basically his motivation is, the universe used to be dark, and I liked it that way, so let's make it dark again. And that was pretty much it. Um, most of his meaty scenes, I think, were cut uh, from the film. I never really watched the deleted scenes on the DVD, but yeah, totally uninteresting villain. Um, after that, I would rank Ultron. Ultron, and that's mostly down to just, I don't know, choices with the character that I just didn't find uh, very suitable, wasn't really intimidating. You know, they made him a little bit too wacky, I think, to really take seriously. Um, then there's Johann Schmidt, a.k.a. the Red Skull, played by Hugo Weaving in Captain America, the First Avenger. Um, I was disappointed in this mostly because Hugo Weaving, I like him so much, so I was expecting really something great and didn't get it. You know, uh, he just uh, is not that interesting of a character overall. And, uh, you know, Hugo Weaving so much better in the other Joe Johnson movie. He was in The Wolfman, <laughs> which he has much less screen time. Uh, but still, he makes uh, quite a good impression, as he does in almost every other movie he's in except for that one. Just not a very interesting character, I'm afraid. Um, after that, Ronan the Accuser from Guardians of the Galaxy is played by Lee Pace. Um, another sort of humorless character. Not that much fun. Um, yeah, and uh, not, uh, not a villain you can really enjoy watching all that much. He's just sort of mean. Um, so yeah, not crazy about him. After him, um, Ivan Vanko. Again, this is from worst to best. Ivan Vanko, a.k.a. Whiplash from Iron Man 2. I like Mickey Rourke. I think he has some style here, and he has some good moments as well. Um, so I'm not demeriting him or anything like that. Um, overall, it's just, yeah, he's, he's fine. You know, the movie is, is good, I like it, and he's a good villain. Nothing especially noteworthy, but he has his moments. Um, next after that, Emil Blonsky, uh, played by Tim Roth and The Incredible Hulk. I really like Tim Roth a lot, and I thought he was a really interesting choice. Um, this movie came out in 2008, same as the first Iron Man. And, you know, really sort of getting a taste for how Marvel will be doing things by casting these really cool character actors. In, in this comic book movie, it's just so strange to see Tim Roth playing like some special forces guy, when normally he's this skinny little guy who's not really a fighter or a combat type of person. But he was really good in the part. 
um, until, of course, he became the abomination in the climax, in which case Tim Roth is completely gone, and it's just a big CGI effect, you know, two big CGI characters smashing each other. So points off for that. Other than that, though, I really liked the character. I thought it was really interesting. Um, after that, Alexander Pierce, played by Robert Redford uh, in Captain America, The Winter Soldier. There's a few different villain-type characters in that movie, but he is the head of them all. And a good surprise, actually, a good surprise that he turned out to be the, uh, the villain. Uh, he seemed like, you know, someone who'd be on Cap's side, but as it turns out, he's against him. He's part of uh, Hydra, <laughs> which was great. And I like Robert Redford a lot. He's got a lot of charm. Um, liked him in a lot of movies over the years, and um, yeah, he's good in that too, you know. My only complaint about Alexander Pierce is that uh, he's sort of a behind-the-scenes guy, doesn't do much actual fighting, which makes sense because Robert Redford is, you know, about 70 or something like that. Still looks great for his age, really. Um, yeah, just, just, uh, just didn't rank him any higher because of that. Um, then Darren Cross. Darren Cross, played by Corey Stoll in Ant-Man, makes a really good, uh, <laughs> intimidating guy. Um, he's got some sort of weird sort of twist involving the end, uh, where he's like doubting himself all of a sudden. Didn't really understand that moment right there. That aside, he, he made for a good character and a good adversary. Um, and I probably will either appreciate him less or more with subsequent viewings. I don't know, but I've liked him. Um, the actor, of course, Corey Stoll, and uh, makes a good adversary. Yeah, like I said, not, not a lot to say about it at this point, but I did like him. Um, then Aldrich Killian, played by Guy Pierce in Iron Man 3. Of course, the big thing was that is that, you know, um, the Mandarin was supposed to be the villain, but he's actually just a decoy. And Aldrich Killian, the extremist guy with the, you know, fire body parts. Um, <laughs> plus, of course, he gets to say Shane Black dialect, which is awesome. There's this one part where uh, Tony Stark's reaching for Pepper, and then, bam, you know, Guy Pierce knocks him out of the way, and then turns to Pepper and goes, is this guy bothering you? That's, like, classic. Uh, he's got a lot of great moments in the movie. I like Guy Pierce a lot. He's he's a very good character. Um, number two, Loki. Loki, played by, of course, Tom Hiddleston. He has the distinction of being the primary villain in two Marvel movies, not just one. Um, and, uh, and yeah, he's lots and lots of fun. He's, he plays the character of the Hilt, Tom Hiddleston does. Um, and uh, although some of he can be a little bit lame at times, um, he still has a lot of style and, and, is, and is just a fun guy to watch. Um, and finally, my favorite of all the Marvel villains so far would be uh, from Iron Man 1, Obadiah Stane, played by Jeff Bridges who I should have remembered was an actual villain just by watching the trailer, but when he pulls out the paralytic device, <laughs> and <laughs> that, that's, that's a really great moment. And plus, Jeff Bridges is just so much fun. You know, playing a villain character with that kind of sing-songy voice uh, that he, you know, does in, in most of his movies is really just an exciting thing. And uh, then, of course, he gets his own Iron Man suit. My only complaint about Iron Man 1 is the fact that Obadiah Stane has no time at all to practice using the suit, whereas Tony Stark has like weeks to practice using it, and yet he's able, and yet Stane manages to use it perfectly. Aside from that complaint, really, really great character. Jeff Bridges is a heck of a lot of fun, and just, you know, great. It's a little hard actually ranking them, you know, it's much easier to rank movies than it is to rank characters, because you have to take so many of the things into account. I don't know. Uh, the, 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 you'd think the reverse would be true, that it would be harder to rank the movies, but uh, no, it's actually harder to rank the villains. Anyway, there's my little list there. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, I was away for a wedding, uh, but I'm back now making more videos, so thank you very much for watching. I'll see you again real soon. Bye.